for macro cells and it's much more difficult to impose such a restriction on small cells because of the irregular geometry so you tend to have a more flexible spectrum usage approach um, and you use all the spectrum so the right answer was um, uh, A okay um, so in the second one we talk about ultra dense network so it's kind of reversed and uh, it's the reverse situation than usual uh, as compared to usual so normally we have uh, more UEs than base stations but in ultra dense networks it, we increase the density up to the point uh, that we have more base stations than UEs so it's B shot noise model despite the model is not good for noise it's good for the total receive power so it's B again any doubt? No? if you have any question or doubt you let me know uh, the Boolean model, we saw actually that it, it constitutes a good approximation for SNR when the interference factor tends to zero because it actually doesn't model interference. So when we can cancel interference somehow, then the Boolean model works. So it's B again. Um, when you have a single slope path loss model, we saw that um, you have a simplified situation where outage and spectral efficiency are cost constant with the density and the uh, area spectral efficiency is linear with the density so the right answer was A, the wrong one, right? Um, we saw that to define a complex system you can define it in, in, in terms of a few things but one thing that doesn't particularly matter is A, right? You can have, yeah, you, some people define complex in terms of number of parts we saw it's much more important the scale and the interactions, right? We saw it a few times in this course. Um, so the right answer is A. Um, question seven, if a system has an identical structure at all level, it's like a crystal-like situation, like the checkerboard, this kind of uh, systems, right? So in this case, neither complexity nor entropy are particularly high, they tend to be low. So the right answer is C. Anybody got all of them so far? Two. Wow, that's a tough competition. Let's see if Kurt. The hmm. No, well, level E, I, I really mean spatially, right? Uh, any, at any scale, yes. So there was actually a figure in the in the slide. So I'm not talking about probability in this case. Okay. I thought it's the probability Yes. But I didn't say equi equiprobable, right? So um, in fact when you say structure at all level it doesn't really fit with probability here. We really mean structure, right? So it's a visual thing. Hmm? Okay. Um, now if we increase the LOS likelihood parameter L, so we saw this in the context of stochastic geometry, right? So what happens is basically um, for um, uh, let's say for higher distances you are in line of sight which means you can achieve the same thing with lower densities right so the first two weren't really what we are looking for right it doesn't get better with higher cell densities it gets better with lower cell densities because of the high like line of sight likelihood so it's C so only Sandeep is left Kartik still open the competition let's see if you have an exact quo or somebody will win so in a fully loaded network okay we we saw basically we define it at least you know in our work as as a network where you have uh, all base stations are serving somebody right so it's a so every base station has at least one user to serve the last one is basically a full buffer model right and the second one is actually a, a dual thing. So you say every user is served by a base station, but you could have many, many base stations inactive. And that's not what we call a fully loaded network. So it's still A, still open. Kartik fell, oh my God. So that's one to go. So Sandeep still on? Uh, so still, still, uh, still tie. Okay, and then which of the following statements is not true for a? C. C. That's easy, right? So that's the typical problem of SPPP. 
OK, so who got 9 out of 10? 8 out of 10 sword? OK, so you see, not too bad. Good. Too bad we, too bad we are in tune because the course is over. If there was a third quiz, I think the results would have been even better. OK, next year. Um, good. OK, now that the exam formalities are over, we can relax, right? We can enjoy the last three lectures without too much worrying. Um, OK. So today I want to talk more about cellular automata. We saw them partially. So I want to go a bit more in depth, OK? And then the last things I will do after today, tomorrow I will um, talk about agent-based modeling application to Internet of Things. And the last lecture I will um, talk a bit about network science. Now, it's just one hour, and I would need a probably a couple. So I'm not sure how much. Probably give you some ideas and then maybe I'll open up for questions and comments okay so I want to keep it light for the last hour so I'll just give you some pointers in the second slot tomorrow and then you can ask me things or if you have any curiosity okay remember that tomorrow we have a change in the normal schedule so we have the first slot at 9 30 second slot at 11 30 and at 12 30 we have the valedictory session where we hand out uh, the diplomas okay Good. Um, so, um, again, going back to the rationale of why we use complexity science for um, for these uh, studies of complex uh, of networks, it's because the networks are complicated. So, to date, I'm not aware of any very satisfactory theory, okay, that really describes the networks to the extent that Shannon theory described the link. Okay, we are definitely not in the same position. Um, and you know even more so uh, so already with simple networks we would be in trouble in a sense but uh, we do have a lot of complications nowadays different technologies different spectrums uh, used right um, um, sharing of the spectrum dynamic uh, techniques adaptive techniques uh, right internet of things wi-fi uh, LTE and so on and so forth. So there are so many things, you know, coming into play and changing over time, over frequency, over space, that it's very difficult um, to model things. So we are actually um, still trying to do something with closed forms, as we saw in this course with stochastic geometry and complexity and degeneracy and so on. But um, it's also very important that you uh, use the right uh, software tools, okay? We are still aiming to get some decent, comprehensive uh, theory of networks. But in the meantime, we are still to progress with the modeling and design and operation of networks. So we also have to use uh, sim simulations, right, to the extent uh, possible. Um, now, traditionally, a problem with simulations is that it, they are the most difficult um, set of uh, results to verify. Right. If you have an analytical approach, um, you have the equations, the proofs. So you know, if you understand the proofs and there is no flaw, you're fine, done. Hardware, again, uh, you are you can verify things, right? So you cannot cheat too much. So in the lab, everything is being you know is open, right? It's transparent. So as Sandeep will will tell you, there is no trick, right? You you can see the thing, okay? And once you explain the experiment, then you just for yourself, but it's not a black box, basically. Simulations are very much of a black box. So they, they are actually difficult to verify. Because even if you open source the code, and it's not a common practice. In some fields, it is. In ours, it's not. There is some open source code. And some people you know, make the, their simulation code available. But normally, I bet any of you rarely does that when you publish your papers, right? So there is kind of. Um, trust, okay, which is fine, but you know, n in a sense, it's, it's it's not so good because you, I, I, the the foundation of science is the possibility to replicate the experiments and get the same results or not, and then there is some something to be worked out. But uh, it's very difficult normally from the papers to understand what the what the um, authors did and replicate the same experiments in in software, right? I think we can agree on that. Still, possibly with the networks we are dealing with, at least for the time being, there is not much better we can do. So even with the traditional limitations 
for software approach, it's probably the best shot we have for the moment. Okay, so still, still valuable. Another thing that the, the simulations can help um, is actually to simulate and sample very large spaces. Okay, there are some theoretical approaches to simulations, like Monte Carlo uh, theory of simulations, um, which tells you how you can actually sample big spaces in a representative way. So it's not so black or white that you have analysis, mathematical analysis, and simulations. In fact, there are some, uh, as usual, there are some areas uh, where they overlap. And um, if you talk with people that study um, things like you know parallel computing, the theories of simulations, and so on, it would all be very formal. They would tell you how you can you you have to run a Monte Carlo simulation so that you can sample a space in a representative way. And it's very important because in many of the networks we are dealing with, you have a few options available, quite a few actually normally, and a gazillion of nodes. So you have to imagine, for example, if you just have two actions available, which is very basic setup, and you have thousands, so uh, like let's say just um, 100 nodes, which is not a crazy amount, two to the 100 is the search space, okay? Which is crazy already. And it's much worse than that, of course. You have thousands and thousands, maybe millions of nodes, and the actions you can take are not only two. If you consider the CQI set in LT, I think it's at least 15, 16 possible right, decisions. So um, it is important to use simulations because the networks are too big. And sometimes simulation that, that, that has some theoretical support that tells you okay, how you can actually get uh, a clue, how, how you can never hope, okay, yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's, it's a big problem. You know, as I said, I think that that's the single biggest flaw of simulative approaches, right? Because, I mean, uh, hardware, in a sense, you know, it's a controlled environment, okay? So you can easily see if something goes wrong, what you, what you did, you know, is wrong, and so on. Analysis is open, okay? You have the proofs, and, you know, you believe it or not, you check the proofs, and if you know your math, you can figure out, okay? Yeah, you should. I, I think there are some attempts to do a better job. I mean, some people, for example, um, um, make available the code, right? They do. I mean, uh, there are even books that come with simulators sometimes and so on. Um, open source simulators tackle that, right? NS3 or DNS community, it's open. So, you know, there is a validation of the code process, right? So, you, your, your piece of code is not included in the main trunk until it's actually peer evaluated, right? And so, you know, um, there is something going on. Um, I think we should probably, as a community, we should do a better job. But it's you know, it's it's big, it's a big problem, right? To be sorted out by one or one person or the other. So, there is there are issues, okay? But there are also like possibilities to do a better job. So as I said, sometimes you have the theoretical framework to make it very uh, formal, okay? So I've been collaborating in the statistical mechanics uh, uh, work, which I'm going to mention quickly in the last uh, slot. And those guys are mathematicians, okay? So they are proving how you have to run a Monte Carlo simulation so that you have a representative sampling. There are proofs, okay, that tells you there are bounds that tells you certain network simulated should give you that, uh, for example, I don't know, interference behavior. Right, uh, it relies a lot on graph theory. Uh, there are tools from statistical mechanics. It's you know it's a physics uh, field. It's very formal. So I think there are attempts to improve. Still, many papers you 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 have around 
uh, if you if you would try to get what they get, you would have surprises. I, I, I can agree with that. Again, you know, I think uh, it's a problem people are aware of. Hopefully, it will get better. Um, I think, you know, the best you can do is try to make it transparent. So I think if you can make your code available in, your, in a website and then you cite the link in your paper, um, or, or, you know, you can have a more maybe formal approach to simulations, collaborating with uh, people from computer, co theoretical computer science or mathematics, right? Those guys, uh, they, they do run simulations because they are also dealing with huge systems, but they are very formal, right? So they would, they would not fool around with the uh, assumptions and so on. They would be able to, you would be able to support, I think, your, your, your tools. Open source communities, right? Like NS3, it's a good thing because it's a peer-reviewed community. So there are, there are better ways to do simulations than others. What is probably not a very good uh, approach is you, you write your own code and nobody will ever be able to understand it, badly commented, not transparent. And many people do that, including myself in the past. You know, I think though we have to grow a bit as a community and try to you know, have a better way to validate our, our simulation. I think that's, that's the general problem though. You know, it's not just me or you that have this problem, and it's, it's a general problem. Okay, so now this, this to give you know, some idea about why we talk about software tools in the next um, uh, couple, two or three lectures actually, about some software approaches. Um, eventually, what we really want to do is to understand interactions, okay? As, as we said a few times, a complex system is much more defined by the interactions than by the um, uh, elements, okay? by the um, um, components. It's much more the how they interact than how many components you have that matters. Hmm? Um, and of course, networks are all about uh, interactions, like how you, uh, you establish a communication with handshaking, uh, how you basically uh, associate a device to a base station, how you register right, uh, a device in a certain network. Um, so there are different ways you can define a link. Hmm? In essence, though, um, you know the, the what we deal with it's, it's basically a graph, right? So there are nodes that are normally transmitters, and links that are relations of any sort. Okay. On top of the physical topology, you can build other things. You can build a, an interference topology, for example. You just you know connect the nodes that interfere each other, for example, or you might have a um, a topology that takes into account the coverage, right? So only the nodes that are within reach are part of the network, or you can even abstract the thing and go into logical topologies, uh, only where, where um, the nodes involved in a certain functionality or that exchange information are connected, otherwise not. And in this case, you could have actually nodes that are very far apart, but still linked, right? So. All we do, in, in essence, is playing with uh, an application of graph theory many times. Okay? Even if you don't realize it, whenever you, you come up with a problem, you're playing with that. You are mapping your network into a graph. Okay? Whether you call it like that or not, but normally when we talk about topologies and networks, we really mean that we, in our mind. Um, okay, and there are uh, some uh, basically, um, uh, things you know that can change uh, the um, can change the picture. Of course, if you use uh, a different MAC protocol than others, that the topology might change, right? If you talk about TDMA, only the nodes that are active in that slot will be present, basically, in your in your topology, right? Um, just to give a simple example, or if you have a scheduling algorithm, only a few users per unit of time will be scheduled, and the others, as it's as if they didn't exist, right? So it's not that the physical topology tells you all, right? It's the, in the superset in a sense, but you have many other things going on on top of it. Um, interactions can be of a collective nature. Um, now, the problem with the, the uh, Many times, you know, the the, um, the the model of the graph we have in our mind is pretty much point to point. Okay, we define normally um, a relation in terms of uh, two nodes, right? Uh, but many times, uh, some relations are more of a 
multi-point to, to one point nature. Uh, for example, if you talk about interference, interference is not a phenomenon that has to do with a couple of nodes at a time. A couple of nodes at a time. It's more of a, if you want, of a um, star sort of topology, right? You have a few things transmitting in your channel within a certain region, and they are all interfering with you. So it matters a lot how you aggregate, for example, information, right? The interference in this case. So um, another thing is that uh, there is also an element of um, dynamicity in the network because things might cascade, right? For example, a node at some point randomly increases the power, okay? It disturbs me because it's interfering with me. Therefore, I have to increase my power. And then in turn, I disturb the next uh, neighbor until all the network is interfered, right? So there is a whole uh, class of problems treated in, uh, you know, in this sense by game theory, right? Uh, what is the best strategy? So uh, just to tell, actually, that, you know, it might be in our picture the situation is simple, but it's not, okay? It's, it's, it's actually much more complicated than the basics, uh, the basic um, graphs we might have come across in graph theory, okay? There are, there's, there are fairly complicated situations in, in wireless networks. Weird question, Steve. Yes. I mean, uh, why do we still need another way to model networks mm. when networks have been studied very thoroughly till date? Yes, um, I think, uh, you know, I said it in the beginning, I mean, one thing is that um, at least I am not very satisfied with what came out of information theory, in terms of theory of networks. Yeah, but no, there are people that have been saying that that's the way to go about networks, okay? So the fact is, I don't think today, at least if you know something, tell me, but I'm not aware of a very comprehensive and satisfactory theory of networks, okay? So I, don't, I don't at least know such an attempt. People, they still use the, the Shannon link thing, and then they average things, right? And but they are basically still referring to the, um, you know, to the link situation, okay? Um, I think also another, uh, you know, thing is that we are not necessarily um, relying on analysis here. We do analysis to the extent possible, but you acknowledge there are very good tools from the computing community which can help you to understand quite a bit. And they are actually suitable if you have this emergent phenomena because you don't have an expression in the first place for those systems. So possibly a software approach is even better in a sense, right? So, uh, but in the main, I think w what I would, you know, if I really have to say I would like to accomplish something uh, by the end of my career, uh, I would like to have, you know, contributed to have a better understanding of, um, of networks. I think still there is a lot, uh, a lot to do. I mean, and until you have that understanding, I don't think you can further progress too much. I mean, the problem is, you know, until we had the um, theory of Shannon, ICT was basically not really a uh, big thing, right? And then MIMO, MIMO itself came out of a theoretical extension of, of that equation, and then it became a big thing. I don't see that with networks. I see a lot of protocol works, uh, right? A lot of even experimentation, but um, a lot of simulations. I, I really still miss the what, you know, it's, it's kind of until we get there, and the same with coding theory. There are even some, some amendments needed. In, I'm not talking about that, but in coding theory, because coding theory is based on asymptotically long blocks. Hmm? That doesn't suit very well if you want to achieve the optimal code for very fast, like mission critical thing. So it's a lot of work, I think, still need to be done, even in the, the link case, okay? But uh, I, would I would say the biggest challenge for the next uh, 50 years in our field, uh, I mean, scientifically, it's uh, to come up with a, a theory of networks which is at least resembling the magnitude of, wo of what Shannon theory was for a link. And that would lead, uh, I would say, almost immediately to big repercussions in the way we design and operate systems and so on. We are still, we are doing a good job, okay? I'm not saying it's bad, but it's like, you know, the. The, the engineering is better than the science, in a sense. In the past, it used to be that engineering would follow the science in our field. I think we are still not there. So uh, that's a long answer. I think in practice, though, there are, there are probably smart things you can do even without that nice theory, okay? Just using the right software tools, I think. 
So uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, cellular automata, and tomorrow I'm going to talk about Eisenbase modeling, at least a very high level. So cellular automata, there are a couple of papers uh, which, which we published, and I already mentioned a bit about this model. And then we had got another paper recently accepted on the approach of Eisenbase modeling applied to Internet of Things. So they are largely speaking similar. Okay, there are some specific differences, but in the main, the philosophy is, is the same. So you do basically come up with a set of rules mm, which are applied locally and then you in a sense let the system evolve until you get something satisfactory mm. and when I say you let it evolve you simulate basically it's, uh, these are in the main simulative approaches okay there are also theoretical studies about uh, these especially cellular automata okay uh, we take a more pragmatic approach we use it as a as a tool to model the network and to simulate it. But there are people that are studying cellular automata in a very formal way. Okay? Um, as in base modeling, I think. Um, uh, there are special rules for cellular automata. Yes, I'm going, to, I'm going to give some examples. You know, for example, if you. Uh, uh, there is a special example which is nice. It's like where this uh, concept was introduced. But in a, in a wireless network, it would simply be you have a few channels available to use for transmission and you check what your neighbors are doing. So you would tend to use the channel that is not very used by your neighbors, so you don't interfere, right? So you, you tend to pick the one with the lowest amount of, of activity, for example. But normally, they're very simple uh, rules. I mean, we're going to see a few examples. If you have a very complicated set of rules that you can't explain in few words, that's probably against the, the spirit of, uh, of these approaches. They have to be very simple. Um, so, in a cellular automata, you have a spatial lattice of cells, okay? And it um, doesn't matter really how you represent these cells. Uh, normally, they are squares, but, you know, you have just to define some level of proximity. You can extend uh, these things also to less, uh, f uh, less, you know, regular topologies. There are models of cellular automata in 3D, for example, in higher dimensions. That's all possible. Normally, though, you would have a situation where you have kind of a square grid, okay? And uh, an important concept in cellular automata is the state. The state is just some characteristic of the system. For example, in our case, it would be which channel you use, but it can be pretty much anything. The color of a certain, you know, square or whatever you, you can associate uh, uh, to, the, um, to the cell. In ASM-based modeling, again, you have simple entities interacting and you do have signals and rules. So I think at, at a high level, they are more or less the same um, approach, okay? There might be some specific differences, but they, I would say the cellular automata kind of belongs to ASM-based modeling in a sense as an approach, okay? Other uh, mo methods for modeling networks are out there, okay? So there have been... Uh, uh, things like you know um, network science, which we are going to see uh, in the in the last um, in the last uh, lecture, okay, where you apply statistical mechanics. Uh, so you have a very large uh, a very large amount of components, and it's not trivial to see how the a certain situation would uh, you know um, emerge. Then you have phase transitions. Like uh, normally, this is used in physics. Actually, it was introduced in physics, but you can use it also in, uh, in our context. You have genetic algorithms, okay? Uh, another approach is game theory. So there are many, okay? I'm just saying some. Though game theory is more theoretical. I think if you stick to simulative approaches, probably agent-based modeling, uh, uh, genetic algorithms are probably the two main ones that come to my mind. There's been a lot of work done in neural networks, right? So there are... There are a good, good amount, actually. Um, so the basic concepts about the, um, the cellular automata, you have a spatial lattice, as we said, with cells, with states associated to the cells. And you don't necessarily need a physical space. Okay? You have to get away from this idea of the physical topology. I already told you this a few times. It can be possibly, you know, you could have uh, just a logical space where you exchange information. And it uh, doesn't matter really whether there is an associated transmitter or not, okay? It could just be servers in different places, right? So it can be different things, actually. Um, and it can even be just a virtual thing, okay? So automata is an abstract concept. Um, the state at T plus 1, 
will depend on the state at, at t and also on what the neighbors do. So there is a double dependency. Basically, the next state uh, of a cell will depend on the current state and on what the neighbors are doing also. Um, the, the rules you have to follow are simple. Again, if you have a rule which you can't figure out how to explain until you write 20 equations and you spend one hour with your friends, that's not following what uh, is the philosophy of Eisenbase modeling or cellular automata. They are normally very simple, the things. That's the whole point. You want to, simpli you want to simplify the design as much as possible so that you get the best benefit at the global level. And that's how nature normally works, by the way. Um, and typically, they are uniform for all cells. I think there are attempts to extend this to other situations where you have a non-heterogeneous thing. But again, normally, um, the, um, the philosophy of the complex system is that the entities are very simple and normally kind of the same. Okay? The interactions might be very variegated. Okay? But the, 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 the basic component of a complex system is normally um, not very distinguishable from others. Yeah, but uh, the networks that we are seeing today are typically heterogeneous. Yes. More and more heterogeneous. Yes. Uh, I think you could still have a model where you have, you know, that I mean, but you still have tiers, right? So you still have like uh, a tier of some nodes. So it's not that every node is different. Now they're sharing the same spectrum and everything is together. Yeah, I think, again, you know, there are. Um, now, the, um, the tools have to be used according to, uh, you know, uh, their strengths, right? So you cannot, you don't have to use a tool for everything, okay? So I'm, I'm very much against that approach, by the way. I think there are situations where you have uh, homogeneous deployments, right? And within a tier of an ethnet, it's homogeneous, right? So you could, for example, have that. Uh, I think there are works uh, extending the thing to non-uniform situations, so it might be possible to adopt this, but um, I think you don't have necessarily to use it. I mean, if you, you know, if you feel like this is not a good tool for what you're studying, then you can use other things. I think Asian-based modeling might be more suitable in that sense, I think, because you do have, for example, in that case, you have the possibility to have more complex nodes that can learn and less complex nodes. Even in solar automata, though, you can stand to learning and so on. So. Um, in general, though, I think the, the way you design a complex system kind of implicitly assumes that the nodes are interchangeable, more or less. It's cheap things, simple things, maybe uh, a very massive deployment of sensors, right? Stuff like that. So, in my mind, but uh, it's possible that you can have like a more general model of things using CA, yeah. And y these are useful to examine situations where there is an inherent structure. So if, if you are doing things in a chaotic, random way, I don't think this is going to tell you too much. Okay, there has to be some meaning, uh, in meaningful relation between the rules and the structure you achieve within the lattice. Okay, if not, uh, I really don't see the the point uh, of of using CA honestly. Maybe you're better off with some more uh, statistical approaches like statistical mechanics, stuff like that. Could be better. Goal. So there has to be some uh, pattern, okay, which emerges out of the rules you have. So it's not that all the rules are okay, right? That's wrong. Some rules lead to interesting structures. Some rules don't. Okay, we're going to see this. And if they don't, then well, either you change the rule or you change the tool, right? One of the two. It has been studied a lot. So it was introduced in the 70s. There are many, many papers. Okay, even in our field, there are a few. Um, the good work has been done in um, channel allocation, uh, even including learning. And you would find this work normally in transaction on system man and cybernetics, IEEE transaction on system man and cybernetics. Okay. So there, there, there is a good amount of work. Um, so what you, what you have is a, a key concept in cellular automata is the concept of neighborhood. Um, and uh, as we said, the state depends on the um, basically uh, the, st the, the value of a certain state depends on the value of that state at the former time and also on what the neighbors are doing. Okay? Um, so there are various possibilities to define the neighborhood. For example, uh, you normally define a target node. Okay? Now, every guy would be a target node. I'm just for the 
purpose of representation, I'm focusing on one. So you have to basically, you know, to define the neighborhood, you have to fix the node, but then you can do the same for every node, right? So you have a target node, and the simplest uh, neighborhood is von Neumann, which is a cross. So you just retain as neighbors the closest nodes, which are north, south, west, and east nodes, yes? And if you add also the corners, then so blue and orange together, then you have what we call Moore neighborhood. And there are others. There is the extended Moore neighborhood. We consider two tiers. There is even 3D things, OK? Uh, so there is there are many things you can do in terms of the neighborhood. Of course, increasing the number of nodes, it increases the complexity of the system, right? And might take more time before you get what you want, and might take actually more complicated rules to describe the interactions, right? Uh, when uh, the system is ordered, in yes, the, yes. Uh, it is said that it is having lower complexity. Correct. So, here the system is ordered in mm, That's the topology might look like, but you know, in fact, when we tested the um, self organizing algorithm that gave higher complexity than the oh. ordered or random case, uh, in, uh, in a former lecture, we used cellular automata. So it's not so true. I mean, you know, the it might look very ordered, but in fact, uh, you know, yeah, okay. I, you have to map to a certain regularity in the deployment, but you can get complex patterns out of cellular. In fact, very complex. Okay, so now I'm not going into the details, but it's very fascinating if you're interested in the topic to check um, uh, what they can do with cellular automata. Uh, the the first cellular automata was introduced by a mathematician. Uh, uh, John Conway, I think is the name, and it's called the Game of Life, because out of very simple rules, it, it basically you have fascinating behaviors emerging almost out of nothing, okay? And you do have crazy things. I mean, with some very simple rules, you might get, at some point, shapes that are like a starship or a gun shooting a bullet, and then this becomes, in turns, a gun shooting a bullet. So, it, you, you know, you can go as complex as you want. Uh, it is true, uh, as you pointed out, that there is some regularity, okay? So you have at least to try to map your, um, uh, your network into this sort of thing. So you have to be able to define a neighborhood relation, right? So if it's too random the deployment, then this wouldn't be an approach I would recommend, okay? Uh, maybe Asian-based model is a better, better deal in that case, okay? Yes, yes. Uh, yeah, we used cellular automata to model the uh, centralized, regular allocation of frequencies, uh, random one, and the self-organizing one. You can do that, okay? The key thing is how your topology is, right? So if your topology is very regular, then you start to have problems to define this. So if somehow you can map your network distribution to a situation like north, south, so you kind of define sectors, then it might make sense. But if the you know, the, the becomes too messy, the deployment, I'm not too sure you can do something yet. Yes, and uh, again, uh, one thing I want to point out, uh, don't be misled by the representation. There is a whole set of tools where you can actually map things into this. So there is, you could do a mapping of complicated things into a cell or a plant. Okay, so we, we weren't too interested in doing that. We said, okay, uh, let's see if it works first, but uh, you know, and for us it's just a tool, but if you really want, you can, can go very complex, okay, in the, in the mapping. So the visualization looks very regular, but in fact, can be much more complicated than that, Is okay? That the relationships will define yes, and you have somehow to define a neighborhood, okay, which you can do in different ways and depending on the relationship. So I think it can be much more complicated than, you know, you are closer to me physically, right? That, that's exactly what we mean here, right? It can be a, also a very logical thing. N not, you don't even need maybe to map to a physical topology. Right? 
you could, for example, define these in terms of the strength of interaction, I suppose, right? Because the closest ones are the ones that are with which you have stronger interaction, and the, the further one have weaker interaction. For example, if you have uh, exchange of information between servers, two servers could be close if they, they communicate more, even if they are far away. Uh, but, you know, we didn't work on this, so I don't want to go too deep into this because I'm not too sure I'll say all correct things, okay? But uh, it's, it's not just this, okay? It's not just a very regular situation, and if it looks like that, fine. If not, you're done. Uh, uh, you can do a lot of mapping, okay? Transformations. Really. So um, the final state will depend uh, on the neighbors and the update rules, and um, cellular automata is, of course, defined by the way interactions are structured, okay? You will have a different cellular automata if you change the, the set of rules available. Mm -hmm. um, and you can actually have um, different options, okay, depending on the, on the interaction. So some possibilities uh, are that uh, the cellular automata will evolve to achieve a unique state from any starting condition. It's kind of an attractor. No matter where you start from, you end up in a certain situation. Uh, you might have a repeating patterns emerging, like oscillations, right? Or say you, you do have like cyclic things happening. Um, you might have a periodic chaotic patterns. Uh, so it, you can't predict exactly what's going to happen, at least beyond a certain time horizon in terms of iterations, but you, even these things have consistent statistical properties. So you can always draw, for example, empirical uh, probability mass functions, histograms, and they, they, you would have some regularity, even if the, the pattern is chaotic. By chaotic, I don't mean messy, random, as we use it in a normal language. I just mean it's sensitively dependent on initial conditions, right? Is th these are systems where if you change a tiny bit, even a very small amount, by a small amount, the initial condition beyond some time horizon you can't predict. That's all it is, okay? But you might have chaotic systems coming out of a very specific equation, which you know. And uh, even <coughs> if you cannot predict beyond some time, you can still do a lot of statistical analysis of this system. So uh, for, forget the idea that chaotic means random. There are two different things. In fact, chaotic systems many times are deterministic. You have an equation describing the evolution. Okay. And they can be used, by the way, to mimic a random system. So it's uh, more complex than what I'm saying, and more complicated. Or it can be that just the rules are bad and the CA dies out. Hmm? Um, this might be, for example, what you want if you, no matter where you start from, um, you want maybe to converse the situation where you have a regular frequency reuse. I don't know if that makes any sense, but you know, probably in a macro network, uh, I think they tend to use this kind of um, periodic um, reuse patterns, right? So it might, might be what they want. If something changes, then the network should evolve in a way that you end up still in a, in a certain reuse. Um, repeating patterns might be something not so welcome. It's like you could associate it with ping pong effects, like uh, the users keep being associated to different cells, or you know, uh, you alternatively. Uh, increase or decrease power, I don't know. Um, uh, CA dies out, could be that the rule is just uh, use as much power as you want and then no throughput whatsoever because everything will interfere with everything else. Hmm? So you can have a lot of different um, situations modeled by this. So the, the, the original um, uh, cellular automata was uh, John Conway's Game of Life. Okay, in the 1970s, it's, it's, a, it's, a w it's an attempt to simulate life. Now, I would not, uh, I would take this with a grain of salt. Okay, it's not a software that tells you how life can evolve, but it tries to mimic life. Okay, I think that's, that's what really it is. Um, it's a zero player game because there is not actually a sense, sentient, uh, sentient player. It's an AI thing. Okay, when there is no human involvement, you can call it also a zero player game. So there is nobody really playing. It's more like uh, an AI thing. And it uses the Moore neighborhood, like the, this um, one tier, right? Uh, this blue and orange neighborhood. So the rules are very simple. 
and you already start to see from this picture you have fancy things happening and even fancier I don't have it in my slides but you can check there are nice videos and uh, presentations online in a sense it's really mind-blowing what you can achieve with uh, such a simple system okay um, so any cell that is alive you define the cell as alive uh, you know uh, if it's not dead basically with fewer than two uh, neighbors that are alive dies because of loneliness basically mm? if uh, any cell has two or three neighbors that are alive uh, stays alive right you have the you have enough people to to live with uh, any cell that has more than three neighbors that are alive dies this is because of over uh, overcrowded situation right it's like too many people for the resources the system have more or less and you, you can also resurrect a cell now that would be nice to have in the real life but we don't uh, unfortunately uh, have it normally um, so at that cell with exactly three live neighbors can become a live cell okay it's like in a sense if you want uh, generating like giving birth okay to a new cell so that's why it's, all, it's called game of life because th the rules kind of make sense uh, compared to the human life and uh, or any life and you know uh, the, the message here is just that you can get amazingly complicated uh, things so these are very intuitive properties and that's all there is really the neighborhood is very easy there is no fancy math behind and yet the complexity of what you can get here is fascinating so I, I suggest if you're interested to have a look because you really get very interesting things very 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 complicated things can be originated out of these very simple rules Okay, if you think about it, we still don't know how life came to be. And probably in the beginning, it was very, very simple, all of it, right? Now, look what, what, what we have around us. So, it, it kind of makes, it kind of uh, sounds okay to me that this is called game of life, because it kind of mimics, right, the, um, the evolution of life in a sense. So, in our case, uh, we are much humbler than uh, trying to find out where life came from. So, we just try to operate our telecom network in a decent way. So, you could actually have just a cell representing a wireless node, as we saw before, or a network by the same token. It's important now to define interaction. You could have, for example, a network and another network as nodes, and you define the interaction as the uh, aggregate interference they see from each other. So, you can, you, it doesn't have to be a single node, okay, uh, what is inside the cell. Uh, and for example, the state for us is the channel selected by the node, but it can be many other things. It can be the power, it can be the MIMO mode you use, um, it can be what mm, access scheme you use, waveform, right? It can be many different things. So there is virtual, virtually no limit to the state, right? Uh, you can define it as you please. Only problem is the more complicated the state, then it becomes more difficult probably to evolve the system towards what you want right and you could have even things where you have uh, um, possibly you know kind of a layered approach uh, where you have uh, a 3d uh, situation right for example nowadays it's important uh, with this 3d being forming and people living in skyscrapers like with uh, increasing density of population in cities it might be the 2d is not the only thing you have to take into account you might also have to take into account the third dimension right the problem also with having, um, I think, for example, the increasing the variables, uh, like the quantities considering the state, is not such a huge deal. You can always use a vectorial representation of different values of, of state uh, variables. I think it's more complicated, though, to, to come up with rules that will evolve the system where you want it to evolve, uh, towards where you want it to evolve. But in terms of representation, I think with some decent knowledge of linear algebra maybe you might need uh, beyond matrices tensors but there is the math okay to take that into account so i don't think it's a so showstopper the math is more um you know you, you have to get something meaningful out of it so as we said um before basically um you want some structure out of this, okay? You don't want just a uh, mathematical tool and you, you mess up with the rules and whatever happens is fine. You do want some structure because structure is good in terms of performance for us, right? We saw before that if you have a meaningful way to do channel allocation, it leads to good results, low interference. 
if you just do something at random or close to random, you won't get the same result, right? So you have to be smart in the way you engineer the rules. Now, when we go back to, um, when we go to agent-based modeling, we'll see that there are, that's a tool where you can be very flexible in defining the, um, the rules of interaction, okay? So you can test many of them, for example. Okay, so I think, yeah, well that we saw basically the neighborhood for us, at least what we studied so far, it simply means that it's the set of nodes that interfere with the target cell when using the same channel, right? So this defines a physical neighborhood basically for us. Um, if using the same channel as I'm using, you interfere with me, then you're my neighbor, period. Um, very intuitive. Uh, you can do different things. As I said, doesn't even have to be physical. It can simply be logical interactions of any sort, and that's still okay, as long as you are defining your uh, interaction and therefore your neighborhood in a precise way and the rules in a precise way, then you can use cellular automata. Okay, so just to give some idea about what we do um, in the channel assignment algorithm, so I'm going more into detail of what we saw before in this course. Um, the time is slotted, and the cells can measure the interference caused by neighbors, okay, in all channels. So you can just see in all channels uh, how many neighbors are using that channel, right? That's how we define interference. So it's a discrete um, model of interference, right? It just counts how many neighbors are using it. So the more neighbors are using it, the higher the interference. It's not, again, very realistic, but it's, uh, it's a start, okay? Um, a cell becomes active at time t, if it detects a variation on the interference measured over any channel in the previous time slot, okay? So it has to check whether still what uh, she's doing is correct, okay? Because it used to be okay before, but now situation has changed. So at least you have to check, okay? Um, and only the active cells can update their state because they are the only ones that actually have to have a look, right? Because the others mean th for the others it means nothing has changed in the neighborhood. So at the beginning of this time slot, this active cell stops transmitting hmm, and initializes initializes a random timer with a period less than the duration of the time slot. And and when the timer expires, uh, the cell, the active cell, will update its state. So in this case, updating the state simply means selecting a channel and starting transmission. Now, why do we need this random timer thing? What can go wrong if we update? Um, you know, the, uh, one thing I forgot to say is that uh, cellular automata are synchronous systems, normally. You update the state all at the same time. It's a discrete time model, okay? At time t, all the cells will update their state. I mean, all the cells that can do it. And then time t plus one, all of them. So there is nothing in between, in a sense. It's not a continuous time model. So what can happen? Okay, so if, uh, considering that all of them can update at any time. Uh, yeah, and it could, I mean, you can look at what happened before, uh, but it could well be that you just collide, right? Yeah. I can pick what I think is correct based on the past. Exactly, so we are just using this trick of the random timer. So practically, you won't transmit. It's very unlikely that you will have simultaneous transmissions. The, 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 the more granular you make your timer, the better it is. So what I mean is that um, um, you basically, we have a, 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 an M-sided die, a die with M sides, and the, the higher is the number of uh, sides, say 10,000 or 100,000, the better it gets in terms of average number of interfering nodes. It becomes very unlikely if you have a very granular uh, clock no, it's not really trials. It's more uh, like you, s you kind of have sub-slots. Uh, it's not even that. I think, you know, one, one what you do basically when you're supposed to be active, okay, you just pick, it's like um, CSMA more or less. So you pick randomly. And so CSMA works based on the same principle. Right? You tend to minimize the probability of colliding with somebody else, right? Yeah, then you pick right? Yes, no, no, there are iterations. Yeah, this keeps going, of course. Um, 
well what we could see I, I don't know if there is really an impact on that I think what we saw there is definitely a relation between the probability to converge okay and the uh, m-sided uh, thing and I think it's always better to have more sides it's better okay because you just make it simpler for yourself even theoretically we have a formula showing the probability of converging to a uh, interference free situation I don't show it here but you know at least from simulations you can see that having a, f uh, a finer um, uh, uh, random clock gives you a better performance right because you just uh, you're just decreasing the probability uh, that you collide to a very small number right yeah um, I don't think so I think here we just measure and say look there is a collision no we don't uh, we don't I mean you um, but you know what we could show is that if you have uh, um, enough channels okay and if you have a uh, more neighbor I mean if you have a von Neumann neighborhood the cross is very easy uh, you just uh, you know you, you can just show with, with two channels you do a sort of checkerboard allocation you don't interfere with the more it's a bit more complicated but what we could show is that it, it will converge to an interference free situation anyway mm -hmm. if you, you have yes then? yes um, anyway this has been published in an ICC paper and in a Springer journal so if you, if you, I, I mentioned the papers in the end so if you want more details they are explained there so um, basically uh, an active cell um, will select a channel randomly among uh, those that have not been selected by uh, the neighbors that change state in the previous and current time slot so you check when you activate yourself you check what happened in the former time slot and also in the current one because because of this random clock somebody might have started before you so you can check that too now it because of the Moore neighborhood and um, the way these cellular automata evolves you don't have to worry about more than five neighbors because it's like a, a concentric evolution in time so at, at the worst case for you will be to check what five neighbors do in this case even if you have a more neighborhood practically you are worried about the subset this is beyond the evolution at the moment so you don't have to worry about that right you d don't have to care because those guys are not even active okay the the time goes along with the space propagation in this case okay um, so in, in this case at the worst case is that you have five channels all different here and you just pick the six so you need six channels and that's it okay um, yeah another thing we do is that after you update your state you remain inactive for two subsequent time slots just to calm the situation down you don't want like propagation of mistakes and ping pong effects so you have to introduce some calm in the system in a sense right some stability um, yeah just to say you know that for example if you are the first one you will have all the channels available if you start in the second slot you will have to pick among the channels except the one that has been picked by a zero say in the same time slot you start later because of the random clock and then the number of channels available will be decreasing by one and so on and so forth okay um, it might not be exactly intuitive how this thing is true and you know um, I, I suggest I recommend you read the paper okay, and then you try to understand it better if you still doubts are there we can discuss but you know the it should be hopefully clear if you read the paper um, yeah and this we already saw so that's how we basically came up with these figures and again the student uh, emphasized that when we have a very regular structure uh, like a centralized frequency reuse pattern uh, entropy and complexity uh, sorry entropy and complexity are zero if you have a random uh, situation uh, entropy is maximum and complexity is zero if you have a self-organizing algorithm which is um, you know worth its salt you have a higher complexity and an intermediate entropy as you would expect from the what we know about complex systems at least okay um, you can come up with different uh, ways to achieve this uh, one thing I want to emphasize is that even visually uh, okay first of all this guy is as good as this guy in terms of interference they are both interference free hmm? difference is though that this guy is not flexible 
right? We also saw before in terms of robustness that these are some problems in being reactive to the environment. This is my, this self-organizes. So anytime you change something, it will basically you know, take care of it. Here you would have to, if you imagine a network with this kind of reuse, you would have to re-engineer the whole channel allocation. Here, you don't have to change anything. If, you, if your rules are good, the system will take care. Hmm? So more flexible. And um, you know when I said that the big thing about uh, s complex systems is that by starting from very simple and intuitive rules, you end up with uh, so local and simple rules. But this would lead to global and non-anticipated patterns, n not so simple patterns. Uh, not so trivial, that's what I meant. So clearly, even on a visual inspection, there is something going on here. It's, I mean, this is random, more or less, okay? We can agree with that. This is completely structured. You see, we are in between, as we would expect, right? So it's not exactly structured, but this is not random. There is something here. There is some underlying structure. So whenever you have a situation with some structure, and it's not something you can guess just by looking at a small portion of the system, that's an indication of complexity. And that's where, if you calculate, for example, a complexity like excess entropy, it's going to have a high value. Okay? So visually and mathematically, uh, it, it has some satisfactory uh, intuition behind the thing. Okay? So what we are going to do in the last part of the course, which is tomorrow now, only we are going to see an example of agent-based modeling application to Internet of Things, okay? Just to change a bit the system we are studying. And then I'm going to give you a glimpse about network science and statistical mechanics application um, to, to uh, again, uh